Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Thomas Sheridan. Thank you. I think our, all our society is run by insane people for insane objects, mm. objectives. Yeah, know, yeah. And I think that's what I sussed when I was 16 and 12, way down the line. But now I can put it into that sentence that I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal mean uh, ends, you know. If, if anybody can put on paper what our government and the American government, etc., and the Russian, Chinese, what they are actually trying to do, you know, and how, what they think they're doing, mm. I'd be very pleased to know what they think they're doing. I think they're all insane. You know, but I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. You know, that's what's insane about it. Now, John Lennon was a man who was assassinated twice. The first time, the second time, tragically, by uh, Mark Chapman in the Dakota building in New York. The first time, just after that was made. You look at how cognitive, intuitive, intellectual that man was. This was a man who had the potential to literally unify the entire peace movement worldwide. He would have been able to bring everybody together. Soon after this, when he was on the cusp of being possibly the next Mahatma Gandhi, he ends up dribbling in a hotel room in Amsterdam with a needle in his arm and ridiculous signs all around him. He was got to. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And that's what we're dealing with. Now, anyone who's seen me speak before read my books, I've gone into the nature of this condition or whatever it is. And to be honest with you, after all the years of looking at it, I'm still not sure what it is either. Last week, I was in Norway in a, uh, a flotation tank, as you do. And uh, I had this, I didn't know how to do this presentation here. I hadn't got a clue what to do, okay? So I just said I'll take slides randomly from all my presentations dealing with consciousness, psychopathology, and so on. And amazingly, as you'll see, they probably tie in perfectly with just the, all the speakers who spoke here today. And it's just one more of those synchronistic things. This image here is a logo I designed for, the, uh, for an anti-fluoridization uh, campaign in Ireland. And I used the idea of the sort of water goddess and uh, these three spirals here that you see in, uh, in art, in megalithic art, in Celtic art, Gaelic art, Pictic art, whatever you want to call it. But the idea was that information, one spiral, creates a turbulence that moves into consciousness, the second spiral, and then the third one is action. So when we get information into the consciousness of the masses, it becomes a fact in their consciousness, and then action takes place where we get the fluoride out of the water by people actually sitting right into their governments and telling the politicians, I'm not going to vote for you. And uh, I really do believe we will win this battle in Ireland. It's a very winnable battle, and I've seen even amongst people who are not in this scene in Ireland, who just a general interest in politics, I'm seeing more people saying, get the fluoride out, especially since a Harvard study was recently came about showing that it does indeed cause neurological damage in young children. Iron is 100% fluoridated, by the way, and there's a reason for that too. So, but not only was that graphic good for that, but it's also good for today, because what we've seen here today is information processed through consciousness and turned into action. And that's why these events are so important because you will not get the same energetic feeling and consciousness resonance from reading something on the internet or a newspaper. You actually have to get out there, meet like-minded people, and even if you're sitting next to them, the power it has is tremendous. And I will explain how that works later on. So always go to these events, always come to them, meet the people, talk to the people, and support the people that like Pig here, put this amazing event together. Now, I'm a bit nervous about this one, only because I, ne I usually never get nervous, but this one I am because it's a mixed bag. Uh, it's a different presentation for me, and I'm opening up about things I never really spoke about before. So I wanted to do that because I felt like this was the place to do it. There was something special was going to happen here, and it has happened. I'm sure you can all feel it. But the thing is that 
We're played into traps constantly. We have to remember that. And often the traps are the panaceas, the spiritual panaceas, the religious panaceas, and even the kind of new age panaceas are given to us to stop us looking in the one place we should be looking first, and that's in here. We're always forced to externalize everything to exterior power forces over which we have no control. And the irony is being that we are probably the most powerful beings in the universe because as Anthony showed you today, we, chances are we probably create the universe. December 21, 2012, the most amazing day in history. And it is, it, it is the most amazing day in history. You know why? Because the next day we don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> we have, this is how they do it to us. Again, I'm not doubting that there's an awakening happening. Absolutely there is. Just like it happened you know, 65,000 years ago when the prefrontal cortex of the human brain expanded and we suddenly had all these abilities for art, language and processing cognitive thoughts that we never had before that has brought us to this point. Evolution seems to happen like a flower or a seed unfolding. There's, it does have a destiny. Yes, there is a change happening. We all know it, I can feel it, you can feel it. But it's not pinned on one, e one date. And this is what we have to remember that things that they're given to us and we're told about are often distractions from what we should be really concentrating on and just feeling it, going with the flow. Now, I'm not saying any of these things will never happen, but they didn't happen this year, and there was an awful lot of hype that said they would. Now, there was no great awakening as such among the masses, but it happened on an individual level. It happened every one of you on an individual consciousness level. It did not happen in a group. Everything else we were given was to distract us from ourselves and from our own way of looking at things and developing our own intuitive noetic insights into everything. See, I grew up in Ireland and I used to, I had a healthy dislike of religion because in the 70s, you know, the sectarian stuff in Northern Ireland was really bad. And I was also, up until 10 years ago, I'd actually say I was a radical atheist. But some things have happened in the last 10 years that have changed that. And I've softened up, and my basic attitude now is if a religion has lasted a thousand years, at least at some philosophical level, it has value. Even if you don't have to abide by the dogma, you have to respect the fact that it's lasted. There is an intuitive wisdom in there that taps into them and keeps the religion going for that long. But ultimately, we're really responsible for our own future, our own lives. And that's always been the purpose to tell us that we're not. We're always being pulled away from our own our own potential as individuals. Now, so they're always giving us a lie. And what's happening now is, I don't know if anyone knows it at the moment or feels it, but there's, a, there's been a darkness in the world in the last six months or so. There's just been something dark going on. And what I believe is we're actually winding down a kind of a psychic spring. It's t even people who don't believe in 2012 or any of these kind of doomsday prophets, it gets into your subconsciousness. I'll explain this later on how this thing works. And they become compensate, almost compensatory archetypes for the shadow inside us, which we do not exercise. This spring winds and it winds and it winds until it's, it literally snaps. And we're at that point now. And, at the, and the only thing is we have to understand is it's not going to happen. We have to understand that we can only save ourselves. And this has been going on forever. Carl Jung in his book, uh, Flying Saucers. The very first book on flying saucers ever was ever written was written by Carl Jung, believe it or not, back in the 1950s. And basically he said that at times of great emotional, psychological, and cultural stress, people have visions of aliens, angels, ghosts, flying saucers. And it just so happened in the 1950s because of the, the psychic trauma caused by the Cold War and the imminent uh, belief that the hydrogen bomb was going to be raining down on every city in the world, that people had these visions. This has happened all through human history. The reason it happens is because our psychic condition creates them. They don't actually exist, but they, we make them. Somehow, trauma is the only thing that allows us to actually split the fabric of reality. Right now it is, it's the only thing. That and DMT, but in, to a normal person, deep psychological trauma seems to be able to allow us to transform from this reality. You hear the story of the mother whose kid is pinned under the car and she picks the car up like it weighs nothing. She's actually transcended the limitations of this experience. 
and it's the trauma of her child under there that does it. So we have to remember that trauma is an important part of how we're controlled. This is why the news comes on at 1 a.m., 1 p.m., 6 p.m., 9 p.m. It's a regimental mind control technique, very similar to when they make soldiers march. It's the same idea, and it's always filled with negativity. And, at the, and that's because they want to release the neopinephrine in your lower brain stem into your mind to put you in a state of anxiety. And then at the end of the news, you get a good news story, and that's a flood of dopamine into your brain to make sure you come back for your next fix of news at 9 o'clock. Now, they have us controlled because they've been observing us from the outside. Now, <clears throat> as, you, as most of you know, I'm very interested in psychopathology, and I, and I still don't fully know what causes it. It's just so complicated, and it, you ca they still haven't found one thing they can pin it on exactly. And because of that, I decided to look at all aspects of pathology through history. And I did it because Carl Jung said, one does not become enlightened by imagining, by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. This is a motif throughout human mythology and history that's always a constant. We go into the world of the shadow. We enter the labyrinth. We have to go into the dark and fight the demon in order to come from the dark and bring that experience into the light. And if you haven't had that experience in your life, a difficult life, a difficult home, a terrible relationship, a really bad time in your business or something, it's, you will never grow as a person because it's the overcoming of that darkness is the reason why you survived. It was a lesson that you were taught. And this is why I looked at this, this whole concept of pathology and how it affects us. And as I said, I looked at neuroscience, I looked at psychiatry, psychology, I had to look at the brains, I had to look at all kinds of things that could have possibly been, and it was all over the place. And then I said, well, where else could I look? I started to look for evidence of psychopathology in indigenous cultures, and there was none. I cannot find anything to suggest that there are psychopaths within indigenous cultures. cultures. Martha Stout, in her book, The Sociopath Next Door, talks about Eskimo tribes that have a, a system where they kill the psychopaths on hunting raids and stuff as soon as they recognize them. I haven't been able to find anything else like that to really confirm that. It's almost like they just don't seem to happen. And so I wanted to understand why. Now, to show you where I'm coming from, and it's probably, uh, this, this slide couldn't be more perfect for this conference than today. As you've all seen, the Flammarion woodcut, beautiful graphic. It represents a person who's journeyed through life through the material world, and eventually realize that the, only by peering beyond the, the veil that the full aspect is there. That's why he's carrying a walking stick. He's journeyed a long, a long way to this point, as I have and all you have here. And you realize, like a good natural philosopher, that the, the material world is real. In a sense, yes, we do need a reduction of science, yet we do need material of science. We need to weigh, measure, quantify but that only functions within this system. There are forces outside it which impact upon it. Now, in recent times, they've been called quantum physics and so on. We've heard about that today. But it, this is before science was, became a field, it just meant knowledge. And it was called natural philosophy. And it was a belief that the material world and the unseen world worked in tandem. And this is just what we've heard about today, the marriage of science and spirituality. And it's all necessary, and it's all real. And I believe that we're actually... Now, I'm not putting down the 250 years of reduction of science from Descartes to today. That was all, that's been all very important. But we're coming back now. And my own exploration of the psychopathology is now coming back. And the reason is, as long as consciousness remains the great mystery, the unsolved problem, then it's all still to play for. The game is far from over. And what I'm going to present here today is not a polemic. I'm giving you information that I've come across on a few different things, and we're sharing here. I'm not lecturing you. I'm not debating to you. I'm throwing ideas out at you. You check them. You run with them. You go what you have to. And it's like I said, it's still all to play for. 
So are there compensatory mechanisms within the indigenous cultures to deal with these issues? And then I started to look at shamanic and sh the shaman and the purpose of the shaman. And I came across this book about 20 years ago, and it didn't really strike me back in the day when I, when I bought it back in the 90s, but it has very much since. Carlo Ginsburg is an Italian. He, this book called The Night Battles, it deals with a, the last shamanic culture in Europe. They were called the Benedatti, and they existed in northern Italy and some of the Slavic nations. And the book is basically interrogation notes by the Inquisition on these people in the 16th and 17th century, these poor Italian peasants, ask, trying to tell them you shouldn't be doing this. This is the devil's work. And what's so interesting is how the people interviewed in this book, the ordinary Italian country folk, say, if we do not go into these shamanic states, or what they called, what their version of them was, it will manifest in the material, in our culture, as trauma and mes misery and unhappiness and violence and everything else. And these people were so adamant that we should, you know, we're not, we're not anti-Christians, we're Christians, but we have to fight the demon world on their plane in their battlefield. If we don't, they come in here. And this is a common motif among shaman shamanic cultures. And this was the last one in Europe. Now, it started with the destruction of the Druids over in Anglesey in AD 61, I think it was. They have been, this, the Babylon system that we're under has been going around the world destroying shamanic cultures that involve themselves in this kind of idea of the night battle, entering into the other worlds to prevent it coming in here as misery and unhappiness. And it seems to work. Whether it's a psychological thing, I don't know. Whether it's some kind of cleansing of the psyche, or if it's indeed a mystical experience, I'm quite open to all these things. But I do know it works because there's parts of this book where they showed when they were, the nights they were not allowed to go on their rituals, it would manifest as goods were stolen, rapes, and so on would happen. So th this is what the shaman was, and this is what we lack today, and this is what we need to get back. And so then I started to look at Ram and say, well, how can we incorporate, even if it's just a psychological motif, even if it's just a, a ruse to make you believe this stuff works, it's still good, it's still important, and can we bring that into the world today? And is there aspects of our culture and our society where we could actually incorporate the similar motifs in there? So then you go on a cultural kind of exploration. I start looking at art and music and everything else. And you realize that there is a grand purpose here. That there is, we in the West, we're not, you know, in many ways we are being traumatized in order for us to end up in this awakened state. We're coming back to source. Why? Why do they did this? The colonial power slaughtered indigenous people in their hundreds of millions as civilization, yeah right, moved across the globe. In AD 61, Suetonius Polonus, after enormous logistical efforts, managed to get his army across the Menas Straits in Wales and massacre the last of the Druids. Now think about that. Roman Britain was in the midst of a very deep economic crisis at the time. There was a lot of problems, uh, both politically and socially. And yet, what was their biggest priority? to launch an army across the, to Anglesey to kill a few Druids. There has to be a reason for that. There has to be a reason why they feared that. And it's, in my new book, Defeat the Demons, I believe it's because native wisdom, in its own funny way, seems to be able to give us defense against psychopathology and pathological behavior. And why, why then would they want chaos in the world? Why would they want this? Well, there's why. Chaos and mayhem as a business model. There's no profit in human contentment and peaceful coexistence. War is money. And that's really what it comes down. Crime is money. You just think if we had a peaceful society, how much unemployment we had. What would the insurance companies do? Think about it. It's a, it's a business model. It's a business model that knew something about indigenous cultures that they had to cause mayhem. And this mayhem was profitable 
There was a very famous story in Newsweek in the 1970s of the very last Inuit tribe in Canada to get cable television. There had been no murders, no rapes, no problems really in this culture until the cable TV came in in the, in the mid late 1970s. Within the first year, they had their first murder, their first rape, and all the kids were walking around in LA Lakers and New York Knicks gear in gangs. Good for business. And that's the ultimate statement I always use when the people say to me, well, you know, what does a psychopath or a psychopathic system really want? And I'll say, it's nothing personal. It's just business. And it's become so bad now. Now we do, you know, we, 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 you know, we talk about the Great Awakening. We notice that there is something happening. But they're also getting worse. There's definitely a split here. One half is flying off to actually try and do something good with the world. There's a lot of apathy in the middle, but I believe they're just an untapped resource that we have to find. We can't be calling them sheeple anymore and saying they can't think for themselves. We've got to get those people on our side, and we will do it. And what we do it is just by pointing out something as horrific as this. The United States has locked up more people than any other nation on Earth. A half the land of the free. A half a million more than China, which is a population five times greater than the U.S. The U.S. has 25% of the world's prison population. Now, just think about that. But only 5% of the world's people. The perfect partnership of government and corporate interests merged into a single agenda. A strike-free workforce, which is, you know, always shows up on time. Prisons in America are the new slavery. They're manufacturing everything from car components, computer hard drives, to jeans. There's trade shows that you can go to where you can buy a prison. Look at the type of beds they have. It's a huge industry in the United States. It's locking people up and making them work for cheap. Now, it's very easy for us to say, oh, well, that's the Americans. Now, the Americans are only, God, you know, God love them, they're only on the front line. What they get first, we always seem to get later. You know that. We all know that. They're, they're, they're our brothers and sisters, but they're the ones who get hit first. They test everything like that there. And this has, this has to stop now. This is, this is appalling. And people don't know this. And if, if there's one fact you, want to, you can want to take away from here today, is to tell everybody what's going on with the prison industrial complex in the United States. Because this is barbaric. And what happened is, they're locking up people for the most minor crimes for years, sometimes life. There are, the three strikes of your out system, that's the third strike. There are people serving life in prison, right? For stealing a slice of pizza. The two previous crimes could have been car, breaking into a car or something like that, a burglary. While the hardcore criminals, are not getting the same time, but they know a sort of a middle class person or a working class person who behaves themselves will do the work in prison. They won't be disruptive. And it's, it's just so evil. Now, it's very easy to say, oh, well, they're all psychopaths. They're all, they're, all, they're all evil. Well, you know, at the very max, it's 4% to a degree. And you'd really get that 4% where you'd have that clustered in the most like, at the areas that would appeal most to a psychopath, easy money, things like top-level marketing, advertising, you know, banking and so on, politics. The rest would be quite small. So in an average city, you're probably talking about 1% at the most. But when I worked on Wall Street, I can tell you that most of the people I worked with were good, decent people. They were just paying their bills and looking after their families. But you know what the problem was? This, is, this was going on. I don't know about it. No, it's not happening. They're just otherwise good people who've been led into this system. They want to pay their bills. They want to look after their families. And the system itself is more psychopathic than the individuals behind it. So we have to remember that too, that even these bankers, many of them could be fine, decent human beings, but they're also trapped in the psychopathic control grid as well. They've been led into there. And there are, many of them will be paying off huge student loans. And this is how the system works as well. And the denial, the denial that I'm somehow not responsible for that. If we can get those people, even one by one, to say, I'm not doing it. And, and you do see things happening. I'll give you an example of where this is happening. They all talk about, oh, we can't get young people to go into science anymore. 
particularly in the United States, there's been a huge collapse in the amount of science graduates. Why? And they've asked the, the, the graduates why, and they'd say, I don't want to be doing anything for war, and I don't want to be killing animals for shampoo. And this is a major turning point here. If we can expand that across all sectors, economic students, medical students, we will have the ultimate revolution. But the thing is to tell them that it's okay to say no or to find a career that does not like that. And eventually, you can starve the system at the top. It's, this is the ultimate revolution because they're not stupid, the people that run the system. If they're not getting, if the system doesn't work anymore, they'll change it in our favor. And I'm, I'm seeing that right now in Ireland with the fluoridation. fluoridation. We saw it in Iceland as well. The psychopaths are bullies. They will push you and push you and push you and push you, but the moment you say no, they'll try to push you harder. No, they'll push you harder. And then you'll say no, and then they say, oh, all right, we'll give up. We're not dealing with people that are driven like us. They're not driven by passion. They're driven by control. Passion kills control. How did I get here? Was it always like this? Was the world always a mess, as David Bourne talking heads in that video, once in a lifetime? Yes, it was, but it, it's worse today because of mass communication. It's worse today because of advertising and marketing. It's worse today because children play appalling, sadistic video games. They don't even play outside anymore. They're easier to control. There's a lot of, a lot of that has to do with marketing, believe it or not, to get them to spend more money. And ultimately, as I told you, I'm not, I don't normally talk about this stuff, so what has this got to do with the human spirit? What, this badness in the world. We lost our shamans and we lost our druids. Even if those people were only playing a psychological role, it was working. It was working. If they were playing a, a true spiritual role, it was working. We lost our social healers. and We lost emotional safety valves. People are told to behave themselves. People are told to be respectful. And that's not how we are. We have many different emotions inside us, including some quite negative emotions. They have to be purged. If they're not purged, even if hitting a punching bag, they will manifest in terms of illness and psychological and social breakdown. And ultimately, we've lost our care of the human psyche. We've handed it over to psychiatrists and psychologists. We've handed it over. Now, I'm not putting down these professions. I'm not doing this. I'm just saying that's what we've, that's what we've done. And more frighteningly now, our shamans are Prozac, Xanax, Ritalin. That's what, that's what they're giving us now. Instead of dealing with our issues, they're nullifying us. They're turning us into, into zombies. And this is going to have tremendous social implications. And this is another thing we have to be very careful of. I know some people may need a medication. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give here medical advice. That's not what I do. But I just understand that, you know, we have to realize that we can't be handing out and taking medications like they're M&Ms. We have to be very, we have to have stewardship of our own consciousness. And your consciousness is also part of your physiology. It's also part of what you are as a being. And that includes what you put in there. The care of the psyche, it results in the, in, in the strength of the spirit, the soul, and everything else, and it heals, it heals problems. Now, as I said, I went through a, an exploration of the motif of psychopathology outside the world of the synapse, the neurons, neural pathways, the motor mirror neurons, prefrontal cortex, reptilian complex, dopamine, serotonin. I went through it all. And I started looking at mythology and folklore. Again, I'm not a scientist. I'm just an artist, a musician, and a writer. So I, I, I can look outside these things. You see, they use specialization in certain fields to stop crossover of knowledge, because that way they can actually control information. Very important. So biologists don't talk to physicists. Physicists don't talk to astronomers. The reality is all the great scientific achievements, really, if you look at them, they've all either been eureka moments or people who are actually looking at a different field than the one they were actually in. And that's another issue, too, as well. They're controlling the ownership of intuition. 
Mythology and folklore are an early form of psychology. In a pre-scientific era, it was only means by which people could anchor their frustrations and warnings to others regarding pathological predators within the material world, here, without having to rely exclusively on religious concepts such as demons, succubi, and so on. This was accomplished by presenting an allegory of monsters, demons, fairies, and elves in human form, and was probably done to avoid change, charges of witchcraft and blasphemy when religious sectarian tensions unleashed psychopaths, the real ones, in the guise of witch finder generals and the sadists of the Inquisition. Isn't this interesting again? Whenever we started to look at something beyond their control system in terms of a kind of a, a shamanic thing in the terms of, you know, healing women who would use plants to heal, who would, have, you know, what they would call witches or whatever, the real psychopaths try to kill them and wipe them out again. It's a common motif. Any time we start looking beyond the material world, they will come and kill you. And that can't be because, that cannot be because just because we're all superstitious idiots. There's something out there that gives tremendous power in here. And you know what? They do, they're doing that. And we're not allowed to. And that's what they created these, uh, these monolithic uh, religious institutions for. Before psychology, you didn't think, you know, they were just as, they were just as clued in as we were. And this is a picture here from, I think it's from the 1300s, of a demon taking a baby and replacing it with a changeling. Uh, the mother's like, that's not my baby, that's not my baby. A friend of mine recently was telling me that she walked, she was in a maternity hospital, and she said, every so often you would pick up a baby, a newborn baby, and it would have a completely different energetic resonance than all the other children. It was, it was a, that was not a normal baby. It was alive, it was healthy, it was safe. But there was an energetic, there was, there was something not in there. The psyche was artificial or something. And, you know, she, she maintained to me that they were the ones I think grew up to be psychopaths. I don't know that. This is just her opinion. But I found that very, very interesting because it was something I never heard before. And here we have a woman being, this is a 1489, a woodcut here from Holland, a woman being seduced by a devil in the guise of a handsome, well-dressed and charming man. That was the psychopath. This was the, the manipulator. This was the the person who would go from town to town robbing women and, you know, telling them how wonderful they were, and so on. We've always known this stuff. We just didn't have technical terms for it. See, this is what's so wonderful about being us. We're not trapped into the academic world. We can go spinning off on tangents, and we... Uh, uh, you see, our scholarship is so much better because it's so much more fun. We're learning things that were outside the control paradigm. It makes it infinitely rewarding. I'm sure all of you feel the same way. You love the fact that you're awake. You love the fact that you're exploring because you don't know what the next book or the next video or the next talk is going to bring you. And that's, that's what gives us tremendous power. So Bruno Bettelheim was a, a Freudian psychologist, psychiatrist, sorry, in the 1970s. He wrote a book called The Uses of Enchantment. Very interesting book. He basically taught, showed the importance of fairy tales the majority of pre European fairy, fairy tales from this period, now I, I should have put in there, that would be, this would be uh, from the Reformation on, are about psychopaths and psychopathic behavior and serve as an instruction manual on how to recognize the traits and deal with them. A collective folk memory was generated and maintained in these children's stories of wicked stepmothers, deceitful kidnappers, or sly wolves disguised as kindly and familiar people, ultimately revealed to be killers, cutthroats, and cannibals. Jack and the Beanstalk's an interesting one. He, he, actually, he actually goes through several fa fairy tales here, but Jack and the Beanstalk is about a guy who goes into a house, he befriends a woman in order to kill the husband and steal the belongings. That's what Jack and the Beanstalk is. And yeah, kids were told that it's cute. But that's, these were the ways of telling children the world is not a good place, always. There are some dangers out there. And Bruder Bettelheim... He didn't really say it on that level, but yes, he did show that there is a very, very great importance in fairy tales. Unfortunately, you know, today I hope still parents uh, still read old fairy tales like this to their children because it gets into the subconscious and it acts almost like a tape loop and it gives them a very valuable life lessons. What do we have today? Disney. Disney, you know, uh, is not the way they should... That, that's the, quite, quite the opposite. You know, Tinkerbell is not... a 
what a fairy always was. The fairies in all our cultures were actually tricksters and liars and deceivers and haters. You know, they hated the human race. They were, they were, they were shown as almost like a predatory uh, spirit. Again, these, these were about important concepts that, that look, you will, be, you will go into this world and it's not going to be easy. But if your psyche has been, def- has been sort of have a firewall around it, by being read these fairy tales, it'll be a lot easier for you to deal with. But before I get to that, what do we have today in terms of that? The nearest one I can find would be the, the Joker from the new Batman movies. But yeah, he's portrayed as, he's a cool guy in his own kind of way. Not good. We're actually being shown a psychopath who's like, that kind of thing. You see, they're, they're trying to change our, our frame, our reference of moral framework. You know, they're always, this is called crazy making, where they're telling us that reality is not really what we are. Oh, you're not right about that. And this is how they alter us. They were slowly and perniciously altered. Okay, I told you this was a mixed bag. And I, looking through all the different p- bits and pieces and talking to people, I was introduced to the American comparative mythologist, John Lash. And we had a series of talks done with Thomas Malone in uh, Japan. And they're on YouTube. They're all over the place. And they're actually some of the most interesting things I've ever done. Now, John is coming from a different world than I am. He's coming from a religious kind of Gnostic background. But at some point, our workers crossed, and in the middle, we met. Psych- we, we came up with the, we came up with the psychopaths. There's a document called the Nag Hammadi Library. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. And the Nag Hammadi Library was found it was found in the 1940s. It, it, what makes this so special is it, it's about 1900 years old. So it's a very, very old religious text that has not been edited, or altered, or augmented in the time since. So you're really back to the source of early Christianity. And you get an insight into what was really going on back then with the Christians. And the early Christianity was very different. Not only does this contain spiritual texts, it also contains a draft uh, of uh, Plato's Republic, which I find that interesting as well, because that's actually quite a nasty document in many ways. And it also has something called the Gospel of St. Thomas, which is very interesting, as St. Thomas was probably the only gospel that was written by someone who actually knew Jesus firsthand. And yet that's not included in the Bible. This, the, the rest are all by people who came years after Jesus, assuming this Jesus guy existed as who he said he was. There's lots of doubts on that. He could have been a Jewish uh, revolutionary and so on. But however, it's a very valuable document. But one thing that John Lash discovered and some other people talk about is it mentions these race of beings called the Archons. And what the archons were considered was a, an inorganic consciousness that existed outside our perception of reality that could infect us almost like a mind parasite. And what they were described as very similar to the psychopath. And it was also, in a synchronistic term, before I even knew about this stuff, I came up with the idea of a consciousness parasite. And what is the idea of our, our, our consciousness having a parasite put into it by media, by everything, to actually make us less of who we are and more pathological in terms of our drive. And they actually, they, they actually believed that the earth was a living creature, the Gnostics, some sex, no. the, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. And the idea was that why are you worshipping gods in the sky when there's a female goddess beneath you called Gaia Sophia? And she's alive. And the idea was, and this idea developed, that human beings are almost like the immune system of the planet. And these, these, there's other, these other archontic things are literally trying to steal the planet from us. And there's the idea of that they're infecting people, infecting humans, and changing us. I'm, I don't know if any of this is true or not. I'm just saying this is some of the interesting stuff that I came up upon. And the idea is basically to try and kill the planet. And that kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Well, what's been done to this planet is not been, it's not what human beings do to planets. We do not blow them up, destroy them, pollute them. We understand that. We've always we've done this for millions of years, and yet, or hundreds of thousands of years, and yet there's a, there's a war on, on the planet, and it's not any of us doing it. It's the, it's the power control system, and yet then they say things like, oh, humans are terrible. They're re- wrecking the planet. The reality is that humans are probably the stewards of this planet in the material sense. You know, it's, it's almost like they're, they're trying to make us feel like we're a bacteria on this planet. We have as much right to be here 
as sheep, cows, trees, plankton. We're part of it. It's not, and I, I, this is one of the problems I have with the environmental movement. Here's humans, and here's nature. No, we're the same thing. And this also ties into the idea of the transhumanist movement, to detach humanity from, that, from nature. They say well, they're improving us, but they're not really. They're replacing us. Now, it's funny. When you go on these things, you know yourself, you, find, you meet people, and you find little bits and pieces. And I started hearing about these ley lines, and I, ah, I don't know if I believe that. You know, it's a bit far-fetched for me. Because as I told you, it takes me, it, it took some effort for me to get here. Because I tell you, I'm, I'm not Mr. Yes. I, I really t I have to be at least convinced along the way. Or uh, bits and pieces of the puzzle have to start clicking. So I'm, I'm not cynical. I'm a skeptic. But I'm not a close-minded skeptic. I'm, I'm, I'm not a bigot in terms of I won't listen to your information unless I think it's, it's groundless and you are something that you just made up yourself. But when you see th lots of people in different ways talking about similar things, then I go, okay, there's something to this. Even if I don't understand it now, there's something to it. So we know, well, we don't know, but we we're told that these ley lines, they wrap around the planet, and they're almost like an energy grid system. And they run all around the planet. And a lot of megalithic sites are built on or very close to them. And a lot of cities are built on them as well. If you think in terms of that being the nervous system of the planet, you could probably actually control the energetic nature of the planet by doing things with these. So you could either nurture them or you could even damage them. And a lot of these scary cathedrals seem to be built on them. These, these scary cathedrals which are built with, with uh, horrible gargoyles on them. What is a gargoyle? How is that religious? How is traumatizing people who traveled miles to enter into a place of worship seeing these devils and monsters all over a cathedral? And does, does, am I the only one who says this makes no sense? And yet, even, but people have accepted this. Oh, not true, that was great. What? That, that doesn't bring me anywhere near spiritual feelings. It actually makes me want to run away in terror from these buildings. And yet, these, these, these scary buildings are often built on or near these ley lines. The picture up there in the corner is of uh, Cologne in Germany after a massive uh, Allied bombing raid. They leveled the whole city to dust, except the Dom Cathedral. The Dom Cathedral, if you've ever been there, it's enormous. And it's like, uh, it's, it's like something out of Mordor. It's pure horrible. It's filled with these dreadful gargoyles. Ask yourself, what kind of consciousness demolishes a city, vaporizes, burns, and slaughters men, women, and children? But it's very careful as it cathedral. It makes no sense to a normal mind, but it made sense to these people. Why? Because they somehow value that building, as dark and as scary as it is, over the thousands of people they were willing to kill around it. You see, it, it, it's such a strange reality we live in in so many ways, because this is almost another thing, too. It's to make us not feel comfortable within this world, that we we'll always need someone to explain things for us. And, you know, could you imagine if you survived that bombing raid? Your members of your family are dead. You can't get to work. You can't get anywhere food because the bridge is blown up. All your friends and all the businesses are dead. And this thing in the middle with demons and monsters all over it is spared like it's some kind of like precious jewel. You know, I find that incredible. Not to mention the logistics they would have to go to to make sure that the bombs didn't hit that thing. It would have been just very, very difficult. They probably spent months planning to bomb that city so they wouldn't touch the cathedral. And you see, well, we have, these are very strange things. Now, as I said, I was in a flotation tank. I'd had a few sessions in it, and it was a very interesting experience. You, uh, you're completely in the dark, no sound, and you're floating in a pool uh, of salt water. So it's sort of similar to the, the Dead Sea in terms of buoyancy. It's not as thick, though. And I went in there going, oh, you know, we're going to have what, what kind of experience we'll have. And it was funny. It was a very interesting experience. After I lost a sense of gravity and my inner ear could no longer find the center of the earth, I was literally just a, a mind floating in darkness. It wasn't a, a, you know, a psychedelic experience. I was able to process thoughts without any kind of emotions. 
So good thoughts and bad thoughts were just thoughts. They didn't have any kind of emotion attached to them. And it was very interesting because it was the ego was intact, the ego was functioning, but I wasn't, you know, I was thinking of things that might have really hurt me. It, it, didn't, it didn't affect me that way. It was because the body was somehow not part of the process. And it just confirmed to me that the consciousness was actually existing as an individual thing. And then after 45 minutes, I started having spasms in different parts of my body. And later on, the people told me, well, that, what causes that is you're releasing toxins from your body. Repressed memories that have been stored up as trauma in different parts of your body are released via your nervous system. If you have a problem, you know, something you're feeling bad about, you will actually store it in different parts of your body. And that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like there was a discharge of, of hurt leaving me. And that made me start to think about water. And another thing that happened was a friend of mine, we went out to a restaurant, and uh, she had this, like, she said, taste the water. And it was ordinary tap water, you know, table tap water in the restaurant. And it had that typical t city taste. It was, it was uh, you know, had the taste of the pipes and the metal. And it, it just it wasn't like spring water. And she put this metal thing in it, and she just stored it for 30 seconds. And this is now taste it. And it tasted like the most beautiful mountain spring water you can imagine. This, uh, this, this silver rod contained in it the pure spring water. And what it basically does is water reacts to the highest form of water next to it. So if it's poor water, you can actually literally purify by putting good water next to it. And then what we're looking at here is water is very, very interesting. It's more than just like two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom and some minerals and so on. It seems to also have the ability to store data. And that, that, that experiment proved that to me. Water seems to be able to retain memory and, and data. And the work of someone like Dr. Emoto, now he did cherry pick some of the results, but you know, they actually, you can actually show that any kinds of words, even words that don't make sense, would cause these geometric patterns. But he, he still did prove that there's something between the human voice or human emotions that does affect water, and it's retained almost like burning something onto a hard drive. We're in very early days of this stuff now, but it's very powerful stuff because it opens up a whole new idea of how water is actually affecting consciousness. Is water holding trauma? And how is that affecting overall human behavior? And then I start thinking about, my God, the Amazon, they're, you know, they're literally attacking the rainforest on, along the sides of the Amazon. They're, if the water does have this ability to retain some kind of energetic trauma, that water is flowing all over the earth. We have to start thinking, why aren't environmentalists talking about this stuff? Why are environmentalists not looking at them in this way? Water is, I believe, will be in the, at some point a, a very key aspect of new sciences and new, new ways of living in the future. It won't be so scientific, but we, we really have been, you see, the, 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 the elites and the wealthy would always go to these special spas and ponds like in Bath and places like that and all over the world. And we, you know, most people would be locked away from them or you'd get holy water from like Lourdes and stuff like that. There's something to this. It's not superstition. It may, this water seems to have the ability to retain memory, both good and bad. And this could be a key for some kind of a healing process for the human soul or the human psyche. So, you know, what can we do as people in a practical sense? You know, here we are, we're living in the world today. We're living in the world today, and we have to deal with the realities of the world. We can't all pierce our ears, light a bonfire, and do shamanic dances at 4 o'clock in the morning. But we still have to try and do things like this. Okay, our intuition is incredibly powerful. It's, uh, as Carl Jung said, this insight is based on instinct and a participation mystique with others. It is as if the eyes of the background do the seeing as an impersonal act of perception. We, our intuition is so key. Uh, this is how people have made terrible mistakes with psychopaths. They met this person or this toxic individual and something said, I don't like him or her. But they ignored it because they were flattered, they were told they were wonderful, they were praised, and they were love-bombed and so on, and they switched their intuition off. There was a, that's because the intuition is very similar to some of the tests that were done in the 70s where they put an EKG up to plants, and they would have a person come into the room who would be all nice and happy and loving, and the plant would have a very nice... Sound, sine wave. Someone would come into the room screaming abuse at the plant, and the thing would go like this. But what they discovered too, these plants would also react to people who were just thinking this stuff or feeling it. 
And that's the same thing that our intuition is. We have to learn how to pay more attention to our intuition. And I think we are. I'm actually feeling it stronger. And I'm sure many of you, as you've awakened, have found that your intuition is very powerful, especially if you stop watching things like television. Now, the the card said to you, I I think, therefore I am. It's actually the other way around. You are, therefore you think. Now, I won't go too deeply into this, but at the end of the day, we can build a firewall around our consciousness because our consciousness is an end product of an organic process change that began with our underlying consciousness. However, the consciousness can can be fooled because we're using this five sense uh, machine, brain, nervous system, and so on, to experience and subjectively create this experience. But it can be tricked by getting back into this body here. And we have to learn to build firewalls around us. One of the keys to this is epigenetics. Epigenetics is basically, I, I won't go into what that is there, but basically, we can build the structure of our brain according to the thoughts we have. For every thought we have, there is a neurological and genetic cause and effect. It's been shown now that if you think in a certain way, a positive way, it'll have a very different effect on your genetics. And this is, I'm not from an airy fairy kind of, I'm so happy. It's not like that kind of thing, but a a confident, positive way, proactive with intention and action, knowing you're doing something, you're, you're working on something, you can actually build a better brain you will actually have a more, a, a more st- a stable neural, neural network. And that neural network then, as it improves, allows you to actually become more skilled. This is what happens when you learn to play a musical instrument. You start off playing the piano and you're trying to learn the chords. Eventually you do learn the chords. You've learned the chords because new neural pathways are built in your brain to make you remember those chords. So stinking thinking can create a stinking brain. The important thing now is, uh, for us at this awakened state, is to make sure we're not trapped into fear, paranoia, and hype. We're on the road now. We're in first gear. Don't let them put the brakes on. Forgetting us terrified. We now have to go into second gear. And the key to that is how we think about things. This Babylon is burning into our minds 24-7. And we do not deal with these issues on a personal level. We become addicted. You see how people are just addicted now to everything, television, football, and all this stuff, because this is what they're giving us. And what happens is, if you don't deal with that, whatever it is brings this stuff into our life and shakes it up for us, and it's often very traumatic. This is why people who have their act together all their lives don't seem to have bad relationships, because that's why they don't seem to have traumatic events. We all know people, they say, look, they're so grounded. Everything goes so well for them. They're such a nice person. That's because they've learned to build the conscious firewall around themselves slowly. They've learned almost to not tame their ego, but to learn how to operate it and learn how to work with it. Because you badly need your ego. And this is one of the reasons I don't like this new age stuff. You must transcend your ego. God, that's terrible. That's like saying you must transcend your skeleton system, your nervous system. The ego exists for a reason. It keeps us alive. And again, the hero's motif, all throughout history, go into the darkness, go confront the shadow, go look at the badness. We've all done this here. We've all seen this stuff. We've all read the books. And that's what's freed us. That's what liberates us. It's frightening at first, but it gets you out. The battle within our inner world of the psyche and the outer world, they always manifest together. The experience are the the same product of consciousness and reality are the same thing. And you're dealing with different poles of cognitive functioning, the subconscious and the conscious, they all have to interact and work together. That was what the children's fairy tales were about. They processed the children's minds so they could deal with the horrors that may have come later on in life, so they wouldn't end up just collapsing. And then again, myths such as Dante's Inferno have endured throughout human history and in all cultures for a very good reason, because we absolutely need them. If all the energy of our outer life has been sucked dry by a psychopath or a psychopathic system, you will not recover from the experience unless you go back into yourself and begin again. Something inside you brought this on you. If you are too materialistic, too ego-driven, too narcissistic, too full of yourself, thinking you were like hot stuff, it will, the universe will shake it up for you big time. And uh, if you fail to do this, you've, you've, you'll die. You'll literally die. You'll, you'll die of an energetic death, a soul death, whatever. It will happen. And then this is an evolutionary mandate. What we're being told here by what's happening in the world in this terrible system that we're now under is that we better get a fire under our backside and start dealing with this now. Information, consciousness, and action. 
We have to get into action. And again, a consciousness, consciousness firewall, get away from as much doom and gloom and negativity. That doesn't mean you ignore it. You say, okay, there's some really bad stuff happened. Okay, I, I'll process that. I now have to go on, on my own life and work on something positive. I have to do something in terms of material achievement. I'm going to plant a food garden. I'm going to do some, learn a new skill. I'm going to take a night course on something. I'm going to develop something that was a useful skill to me rather than sitting there waiting for the end of the world. If we do that one by one, we will have a mass awakening. And there's also ways of helping you with that conscious firewall. Limit your vision to advertising. I love Edinburgh. There's so, because of the historic buildings, there's so few advertising here compared to many other cities. Most modern cities you're bombarded with. Dublin is terrible. It's filled with it. The trams, the buses going by constantly. This stuff will actually wear you down. And so there's a way to deal with that. Try and keep our houses and our homes. You know, it's also the feng shui thing. As, as comfortable and calm as possible with as much natural light and materials in it. Fluorescent light seems to be very bad for help your consciousness in terms of keep, it makes you agitated. So get the fluorescent light out of your house if you can. You should be able to, there's lots of alternatives now. It's not just the incandescent bulbs that are being phased out, but the halogen bulbs are fine and so are the LED ones. And understand the spin and contacts. So you read an, if you read an article that says maybe, could be, that's not the same thing as an absolute fact. And you'll see every scientific article, scientists now believe. Now, the article start off saying, eh, damage to the frontal cortex is the re reason why we have psychopaths. And you read that, and you go, oh, that's the reason why. And then you're going to go down to the article to the copy. This is how journalism is. It'll start saying, maybe, could be, suggests. That's not the same thing as a fact. Forget the headline, read the body text. And they're always depending on people never to read the body text, but only the headline. Oh, and, and get saturated fats in your diet because that actually helps build your brain structure. Very important. Your vegetarian coconut oil. But saturated fats are actually fantastic for building your neuroplasticity, your brain's ability to rewire itself. So, we can't get the Amazon, all of us. We can't get to Siberia and Africa. What can we do to attain shamanic healing within our own lives and communities? You're going to be surprised by this one. Heavy rock. <laughs> These are our shamans. They really are. I played in so many of these kinds of bands, a group in these scene. I've seen all these groups. And Johnny Rotten said in the pill video for Rise, anger is an energy. This is exercising the shadow of modern culture. If we did not have this, we would have absolute chaos. Yes, it's noisy. Yes, it's intense. Yes, the lyrics are often very dark. But it's causing a purging of the collective shadow of young people. I've gone to so many heavy metal gigs, and I still do, even though I look like a fool. Uh, and, you know, all these bands, and even hip early hip-hop bands like Public Enemy, this is getting it out. I always remember, like, the lyrics alone, like Black Sabbath, Nazi, the song War Pigs, 1970, generals gathered in their masses, just like witches at black masses. That's just, that's it. What else do you need to know? And that gets into kids' heads, and they realize they become anti-war. Black Sabbath, for all the, 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 you know, the negativity thrown at them, they were actually a, an integral part in the peace movement in America because lots of Vietnam vets were following them around at the time. You never hear about that. And the cult, Sonic Temple. Yes, that's it. This is it. Get it out. Purge it. And that's why they don't like this music, and they want us listening to Boys Own and Westlife. Simon Cowell and Louis Walsh are the spawn of Satan. Yeah. Laugh. It actually expands your cellular walls. It releases endorphins. Anxiety and misery get you nowhere. It just makes the parasites happy because they can feed on you. Let me, let me show you how important the comedy is. We know Bill Hicks is dead, right? We know George Carlin is dead, right? But when you see a video of them on YouTube or anyway, any, any other video source, do you see dead people? They're as alive today as they were back when they were actually alive in this reality. There's something truly powerful about that. Their comedy is more than just jokes. This has always been something that gives us power. Yes, it can be offensive, 
the life of Brian could be very offensive to Christians, but they weren't making fun of Jesus. They were making fun of the fact, as Douglas Adams said, 2,000 years ago, they nailed a poor guy to a plank for saying it would be a good idea to be nice to each other. That's what farce, lampooning, and all this stuff is. And that's why it's so important. And you hear things like, you know, this guy Howard Stern here in the bottom and Frankie Boyle, oh, they're so offensive, they're so offensive. But within that, there's, there's nuggets of wisdom that they can get away with that other people can't. And that's important because who was the one who could insult the king? The jester, right? The only one who could do it. And political correctness, political correctness was invented not to go after the Bernard Mannings and the Benny Hills. It was invented to go after the comedians who were actually coming up that time in America, Canada, and UK who had very good political satire that was actually challenging the system. And then, they came, then comedy went really downhill after that. You could not have really hardcore pol com comedy politics, but they pretended, oh, we have to be very careful. And you got all these lame comedians that came up afterwards that really had nothing to say in terms of satire, in terms of lampooning the system. And that's what they did to us. And I mean, you, you have to laugh. You have to, on this, you have to le learn your, uh, your ability to laugh at yourself. Very important. You have to understand your own absurdities because how else are you actually going to have a self-reference? I often thought that if they laughed at the Nazis in the early days in their silly uniforms and their goose step, we would have actually got rid of them. When you give in to the fear of them, that's when the bullies win. You think, you know, you, you, you think that it's just, it's, it's, it's just something, it's just cheap entertainment. But Bill Hicks wasn't cheap entertainment, neither was George Carlin. These people were prophets. And their, their, their message will go on forever, long after the politicians and their speeches have been forgotten. And I spoke to a shaman in Dublin. He was from the Niltec people in, in, in Eastern Africa. And I said to him, I told him about psychopaths. And he says, that's what I was telling him I was into. And he says, ah, oh, this, oh, you know, that, yeah. And I said, what do you think they are? And he says, oh, well, we consider them the demon world trying to invade this world. And I went, oh, okay, and then what does that really mean? And he says, well, it really means you hate yourselves. You in the West hate yourselves. You've been told to hate yourselves by fashion, marketing, design, women's magazines. You're always feeling inadequate. You don't have as much money as the footballer. And stop saying excuses and living up to people's other expectations of you. You manifested in here for your own life. I had friends up in Manchester at an event up there saying, Thomas, we're woke up and everywhere, but we still support City. And I said, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be sitting in an ashram going, mm, to prove that you're actually consciously aware. There's nothing wrong with liking mainstream stuff. Just don't believe that those people love and care you. It's just entertainment. You have to keep one foot in the reality too. And unload the doom junkies. I have to keep saying that, get rid of them. Unless they come with a positive solution, solutions are the only thing that work, and, and real solutions, not, you know, the spaceships are coming. That's not a solution. A real solution is, let's build an airship. Let's form a, an alternative community. Let's spread fires out. Let's put together the Awakened State Conference in, in Edinburgh. That's what we need. And again, you see that thing up there? The eye on the top of the pyramid? That's just an eye on top of the pyramid. It means nothing else. No symbol on this earth is greater than you as a sovereign being. They're just symbols. Flags, religious icons, they're just symbols. Take them back, be creative, build your own neuroplasticity, engage with your shadow and master it, ignore hype and sensationalism, independence of body, mind, and spirit, cynicism, and a healthy skepticism. That's important. Don't be closed-minded. Be open-minded, and if something doesn't ring true with you, ignore it. Maybe it's for someone else to uh, work on. And understand how amazing your mind is. Do not take yourself for granted. But do not be subject to all the stuff like, oh, it's a, it's a big evil symbol. It's just a drawing. And there's two kinds of people in this world, those who give energy and those who take it. Okay? It's really been that easy. And being awake is the only worth doing if you're going to make use of it by creating and building tangible results. Here we are. We've created magic. We have the pig people. Sorry, I hate to say that. <laughs> the pig people. <laughs> Not a John Lennon synchronicity. You came here and you created magic. This event was manifested out of the ether. We're all here. That's how easy it is. The dependence on negativity is a trap. I won't go too much into that. And you get out of all that and you start thinking by yourself. And as Morrissey stated, no regime can buy or sell me then. 
And I'm going to finish quickly. My website is thomasheridanarts.com. And again, I started talking about how information and consciousness leads to action. Okay. Inside our brains are something called mirror neurons. And this is why these events are important. The mirror neuron processes empathy. When I say empathy, I mean understanding between people, okay? They've been shown now to work over vast distances. Everyone in, you, in this room now listening to me are now firing their mirror neurons in sympathy of each other, and you're all bonding, even though you don't know it, but you are. Mirror neurons is a very new aspect of neuroscience, but it's a very powerful one. When you leave here tonight, I want you to go home on the train, bus, or car, whatever, and have that feeling that you have inside you now, and it will spread to people around you. This is the 100 monkeys effect. It's now been scientifically proven. You don't have to walk down the street with a megaphone. You just be secure of the information you have in your head. And especially if two or more people on a railway carriage are thinking this at the same time, if you're on the same train carriage tonight, the ones all in between, their, more, their mirror neurons will start firing in sympathy with your beliefs. This is, what, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. There's a lovely film, and I'm just going to finish with this now. Uh, it's, it's the modern version of The Last of Mohegan to Daniel Day-Lewis. And there's a scene in the film where he leaves Madeline Stowe, and he says, you know, no matter what occurs, I will find you. It's a beautiful line, a beautiful sentiment. He has to leave her. And that's when we leave this place tonight. If they, throw, they start the war with Iran, no matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what occurs, we'll all find each other eventually. Thanks very much.